All right, so we're continuing with section 5.3 here. Let's see, we are now ready to look at our inverse functions from an analytic perspective or from the perspective of the equations themselves. So we already know we can determine whether or not a function has an inverse is to look at the graph and see if it passes the horizontal line test. I'm going to use that same technique even when I'm given an equation. I'm going to say, since I've got such great technology, I can graph the line. And as long as the graph passes the horizontal line test, I will know that the inverse exists. All right, I didn't pull a decimal screen up, so I'm just going to graph on my calculator for these simple little graphs. First graph is one of our new ones. It's an exponential function, right? I'm going to graph the function e to the x. Notice I've used Euler's number there as the base minus 4. And not surprisingly, there's an exponential growth curve. We would have expected that. It's kind of like that. And if I imagine any horizontal line, it's only going to hit that graph once. I know that way down here near the horizontal asymptote, it may look like that's a horizontal line, but remember we know from our previous experience with graphing that that keeps on decreasing ever so slightly all the time. So technically, even over here near the horizontal asymptote, there's really only one point at a time that gets hit by the horizontal line. So that one passes the horizontal line test. And that tells me it's one-to-one. -one. And that tell me, tells me it has an inverse. Right this moment, we're not being asked to find it yet. We're just being asked, does the function have an inverse? And yes, in this case, it does. All right, let's test the next one. Again, easiest way, even though I'm given an equation, easiest way is to just use technology to generate the graph. So x cubed minus 4x. There's our graph. And it looks like this one's not one-to-one, -one, right? If you notice, there are certainly y values. For example, that one defined by that horizontal line that had three x values that actually generated that y value. Fails the horizontal line test, and therefore it's not one-to-one. -one. Only one-to-one -one functions have inverses, and since this fails to be one-to-one, -one, there is no inverse function. All right, so when we have a function defined analytically with an equation, if we're asked to find the inverse, it's probably wise to check the graph first and just make sure the inverse actually exists. But once we know the inverse exists, we have a function that passes the horizontal line test, how would we actually find the inverse algebraically of a function defined with an equation? Well, I'm going to go back to the idea that we already know in an inverse function, the x's and the y's are switched. So, I'm going to start by rewriting my function just in the form y equals as opposed to f of x equals. And then I'm going to create the inverse function right here. I'm going to literally swap the x's and y's. We already have seen that happening with the table of values. We're now going to do it algebraically with the numbers, or with the letters, I mean, x and y. We'll take our equation, solve that new equation for y, and that's going to be our inverse function. So we'll just put the notation on it. 
All right, so my first function that I'd like to find the inverse of is f of x is 2 times x plus 3 plus 1. First of all, am I sure the inverse even exists? Well, it wouldn't take very much to find out. If I graph this, it's just a line. I would have expected that with the x to the first. And of course, that line certainly passes the horizontal line test. So yeah, it's perfectly good to find a function. Function's going to, uh, inverse function, it will exist. All right, so let me follow this format here. I'm going to start by rewriting this in the form y equals 2 times x plus 3 plus 1. And then right here in this next step, I'm going to switch the x and the y. So this becomes the x, and that becomes the y. All right, I now want to solve this new equation for y. So to do that, I'm going to distribute the 2. So I have x equals 2y plus 7. And let's see, to get y by itself, I would subtract the 7. And I'd want to divide by the 2. Now just a note about this division by the 2. You actually can leave it just looking like that, but we often go ahead and do the division by thinking that's really a 1x. So that would be 1 half x minus 7 halves. It makes it more obvious that that's, again, a linear function by writing it in the y equals mx plus b form. All right, that's really my equation for f inverse now. So to finish, all I'm going to do is use that inverse function notation to say f inverse of x is 1 half x minus 7 halves. So we create the inverse as soon as we switch the x and y, and then we solve for the y to get the inverse function notation that we need. Let's try one more. In example 10, I have my function 4 times the cube root of x minus 2. And again, I want to find an equation for f inverse. Let's just take a minute and verify that this is a one-to-one -one function and it, the inverse actually exists. So 4 times the cubed root of x minus 2. Again, you can graph this on Desmos. I just don't have a window open right now. There's my graph, and if I imagine a horizontal line, it would only hit that graph in one place at a time. So I'm convinced this is one-to-one. -one. The inverse exists. All right, to find the inverse, I could rewrite my original function in the y equals form. And then I create the inverse by switching the x and y. All right, the inverse has been created, but to get the inverse function notation, I'm going to have to solve for that y. So I'm going to start by adding the 2. And then I'm going to divide by the 4. And again, if I want to, I could write that as 1 fourth x plus 2 fourths reduces to 1 half. 
equals the cube root of y. We haven't talked a lot yet about radicals this semester, but hopefully it makes sense that to get rid of a cubed root, you just raise both sides to the third power. And I'm not going to try and multiply that out. I think it's fine the way it is. I'm just going to leave that as 1 fourth x plus 1 half cubed is equal to y. Now that I've solved for y, all that's left to do is write the inverse function notation. f inverse of x is 1 fourth x plus 1 half cubed. All right, so that's how you find the equation for an inverse function. Switch the x and y and solve for the new y value. All right, the next thing we'd like to do is talk a little bit about compositions of inverse functions. All right, we started this whole section with compositions, then we went to inverse functions. We're now going to put those two ideas together and take the composition of a function with its inverse. Uh, we actually just worked with this function a minute or two ago, right? This 2 times x plus 3 plus 1. Remember that when we did the inverse function, we got 1 half x minus 7 halves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the composition f inverse composed with f of x, or in other words, f inverse of f of x. And to do that, I'm going to do it in table form. I'm going to pick a few inputs, 1, 2, and 3. We'll plug them into f first, and then whatever we get for an output, we'll plug that into f inverse. So this is just the table form that's going to give me that composition. All right, calculator at the ready here. If I'm plugging my input 1 into f, I'd have 2 times 1 plus 3 plus 1 gives me 9. Plugging 2 into my function f, 2 times 2 plus 3 plus 1 gives me 11. And finally, plugging 3 in here, 2 times 3 plus 3 plus 1 gives me 13. So, so far, I've done f itself. I'm now going to take those outputs and plug them into f inverse. Right? Here's my formula for my inverse function. So again, get some help from the calculator here. My input for f inverse now is 9. So I'm going to take 1 half times 9 and subtract 7 halves. And that gives me 1. Plugging 11 into the inverse function, 1 half times 11, minus 7 halves, gives me 2. And then finally, plugging the 13 into the inverse function, 1 half times 13, minus 7 halves, gives me 3. So, what happened? We took an input, we did f, and we did f inverse, and we just got back what we started with, right? Every single time. Is that very surprising? It shouldn't be if you think about what inverse functions really do, right? The function does something, and the inverse function will undo it. So we've done something to the 1, 
The inverse undoes it, and I'm back to the 1 again. So whatever our input is, we do something with f, and then we undo it with f inverse, and we're back to our original input again. All right. There's a more formal way of writing that. Actually, I should do that before I go to the next page, probably. Let's write that out just a little bit more formally. This said, first I'm doing f of whatever my input x is, and then I'm doing f inverse of that. And it just gives me the original input x back again. I could write that in composition form, as we did at the top, f inverse composed with f of x should always equal x. Do something, undo it, and you just get x back again. Okay. I'm also going to say it works in reverse as well. If I take f composed with f inverse of x, I should also get x back again. Again, here I'm just kind of undoing first and then redoing, but we should still get our original input back. So, we've done that now using the little chart for our functions. I'd now like to find the composition algebraically. Okay. So we're going to kind of prove that little fact that I just said by trying this one. My function f of x, again, was 2 times x plus 3 plus 1. And we had already found the inverse. It was 1 half x minus 7 halves. Algebraically, I'm now going to find the composition f inverse composed with f of x. Or f inverse of f of x. That would be f inverse of this original function. I'm going to simplify that a little bit. That's 2x plus 6 plus 1, or 2x plus 7. And if I now take that 2x plus 7 and plug it into the x here in the inverse function, I'd have 1 half times the 2x plus 7 minus 7 halves. I'm going to distribute the 1 half. So let's see, 1 half times 2x would just be 1x. 1 half times 7 would be a positive 7 halves. And then I have a negative 7 halves out here. Positive 7 halves and negative 7 halves, that's just 0. So indeed, as predicted, we just get x, right? Started with x, I do something, I undo it, I get x back again. Okay. Let's try it in the other order. Let's do f composed with f inverse. Should be the same thing this time because, again, we're doing and undoing, but let's just show that it works. Same function, f and f inverse, and this time I want f of f inverse of x. So let's see, that would be f of 1 half x minus 7 halves. 
And let's see, that would be two times. In place of that x, I'm going to put the 1 half x minus 7 halves. And then there's a plus 3 still in the parentheses. And then that plus 1. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the 2 right now. 2 times a half makes that 1x. Here I could kind of cancel out those 2s. 2 times negative 7 halves is just negative 7. And the 2 times 3 would give me a plus 6. And then I have the plus 1. And notice negative 7 plus 7 is 0. So once again, I just get the x. So, I've now seen this algebraically as well as numerically, and we're going to go ahead and say, yeah, it looks like this is true all the time. The composition of f and f inverse in either order just gives us the original x back again, doing and undoing. Okay. All right, before I get to just a couple of examples of applications, I want to remind you how important inverses really are in math. When we solve equations, even simple equations that you've been solving since beginning algebra, right? When you were taught to solve equations, they probably didn't use the words inverse function, but that's really what they were doing. When you were taught to solve an equation like x minus 5 equals 9, you were probably taught just add 5 to both sides. Can you see that what you were really doing was applying the inverse function? The inverse of subtracting 5 is adding 5. And that's what you did to get x by itself. Right? Our goal was to get x by itself. So we really were saying, hey, whatever function I have, apply the inverse. And that gets x alone. Over here, you're multiplying the x by 7. When you were taught to divide both sides by 7, again, you were really applying the inverse. Inverse of multiplication is division. And that got you your x equals 4. Again, the inverse function gets the x by itself. And this last one, you would have used the cubed root, which is the inverse of the cubing function, to get x by itself and x equals 2. But the inverse functions, and actually even the compositions of the inverse, are all hidden in those seemingly simple algebraic operations, which you can now kind of understand from a little bit higher level perspective. Okay. A moment here for me to get on my soapbox. One of the reasons that math teachers tend to dislike the word cancel is because cancel means different things in different situations, right? Here people like to say, oh, cancel those fives and we get 14. And over here they might like to say, hey, cancel those sevens and we get x equals four. Well, what does cancel really mean? Here it means add the five and the negative five to get zero. Here it means seven divided by seven is one. Those don't mean the same thing at all. So try not to use the word cancel. What you're really doing are inverses. And so what I'll usually say here is, ah, those are inverses, they add up to zero. Or those are inverses, they divide to one, right? But I try to avoid that word cancel because it means a different thing in a different situation. All right, climbing off the soapbox now. We're going to finish this section by looking at a couple of problems that are applications or mathematical modeling. We have one slight issue with applications that's a little bit different than just generically finding an inverse function. Remember how when you found an inverse function algebraically, you switched the x and the y, you swapped them? That becomes a little bit more problematic in mathematical modeling because typically we choose the variable names to represent what we're talking about like we might use t for time, or we might use p for population. 
if we actually switched those variables, it would get really confusing because now P would mean time and T would mean population. And we kind of don't want to do that, right? That's going to mess us up. So what we typically do is we skip the step of physically swapping the variables. And all we do is instead we just solve for the other variable or the original independent variable and then rewrite with our inverse function notation. Let me show you exactly how that looks. In example 11, we have a pretty famous formula for converting Celsius to Fahrenheit temperatures. Fahrenheit temperature is 9 fifths times the Celsius temperature plus 32. And I could write that in function notation. I could say the Fahrenheit temperature is, let's call it G of C, is equal to that function. Okay. All right, I'd like to write an equation for the inverse function. So I'm going to start with my F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. And I don't want to switch the variables because that would be swapping what F and C mean. Instead, I'm just going to solve for this independent variable. I'm just going to solve for C. To do that, I would subtract the 32. So F minus 32 equals 9 fifths C. And then to get C by itself, I could mul multiply by 5 over 9. That's going to divide out the 9s, divide out the 5s, right? Those were inverses. And that's going to give me the C by itself. You could distribute that 5 9ths if you want to, but you don't really need to. I'm just going to leave it that way. Okay. And now I've got a, an equation for C in terms of F. Let's write inverse function notation for that. Originally, I used the letter G, so I'm going to now say C equals G inverse. My new input variable is F, so it'll be G inverse of F. And that's 5 ninths times F minus 32. So, you can see I'm still using my inverse function notation, but because I haven't swapped my variables, notice that the name of the input variable switches. C was the input for the original, F is now the input for the inverse function. Okay. This function took a C and converted it to F. Notice my new function takes an F and converts it to C. So it converts Fahrenheit to Celsius. All right, so we're going to take a couple of function values and talk about their meaning. First of all, I want to find G of 45. G was the original, so G of 45 I will find by just plugging in 45 for that C value. And that's not terrible, but I'm going to let it be a calculator moment here. I'm going to go ahead and do 9 fifths times 45 plus 32. And that's 113. Now remember, in the original function, the input was C, and the output's going to be F. So what we're really saying here, what this means, is that 45 degrees Celsius is the same as 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. 
In part C, I want g inverse of 45. So now I'm going to go up to this inverse function that I found, and I'm going to plug the 45 in for the f this time. So I have 5 ninths times 45 minus 32. And again, I'm just going to use a calculator to help me with that. About 7.2. This time, for g inverse, my input was f, the output is c, so this one says that 45 degrees Fahrenheit is 7.2 degrees Celsius. All right, I believe I've got one more, yet one more example here. This time our modeling, instead of starting us out with an equation, is going to start us out with a data set. So let's see. The number of cremations in the United States has increased steadily since the year 2000, as shown in the chart. So for various years, this is the percent of people that chose to be cremated. And we're supposed to start by finding a reasonable model, C equals F of T, to fit that data. Uh, C is percent cremated, so this is C, and T is years after 2000. So let's make ourselves a quick little T column here. 2000 is the year 0, so I'd have 6, 11, 16, and 21. Let me see. I should have opened my Desmos earlier. Give me one quick second. Let me see if I can open a Desmos screen that'll fit into my current window here. I think it's going to work. Yeah, there we go. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my values here in a table. All right, so looking at that, it looks to me like a linear model would work quite well. It looks like those points line up pretty nicely, in fact, as a pretty straight line. So let's go ahead and get our linear model here. That was mx1 plus b. Been a little while since we've used that one. And we can see visually, yeah, it looks pretty good. The r squared is great. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. All right. So, I'm going to say for my inverse, or excuse me, for my function itself, c of t could be written as, see my slope about 1.5155 times t plus the y-intercept down here. Uh, 25.7325. So there we go. There's my C of T function. I'd like to now find an equation for the inverse function. And I'd like to discuss two possible ways to do that. And then we're going to pick which one we like better. I don't think I'll actually even compare them. Because they'll give similar, although not quite identical results. If I want the inverse of this function, one way we know to do that 
is to just switch the inputs and outputs, right? So if I wanted to, I could just make a new table where C was my input and T was my output. And I can do that pretty easily. The C's, just take them from here. And then the T's. So just by swapping my X and Y values, get this thing out of the way, just by swapping my X and Y values, I know I've created an inverse function. Well, once I have a new table, I can do the regression again. And that's going to find me an equation for my inverse function. So let's try that. Let's see, I'm going to get rid of these. And in my new table, put in my data in the new order here. And again, I'm going to fit that data. Looks linear again, so that looks really good. And so I'll do a linear regression on Desmos. There we go. Once again, a good fit. And here's my new slope and y-intercept down here. So, this time, the output is T, and the input is C, so T would equal, uh, let's see, the slope was 0 0.6582, if I keep four decimal places again, times C, the input variable, minus 16.9111. All right, so I've got my function and my input function, or my inverse function here. And you know what? I probably should use slightly different notation because right now I'm having a hard time with the inverse function notation, and it was because I didn't follow instructions. This said to write my model as c equals f of t. Let me fix that and do it that way instead of c of t. Let's write c equals f of t. That way, I can now write my t as the inverse function with the input variable c. So I've got a function, and I've got an inverse function. Okay. All right, I will just mention this, and you can do it if you be interested. Um, you could also have found an inverse function algebraically, right, by taking this original equation and solving it for t. And you should have come up with something very, very similar if you do that. Um, there might be just a touch off because of some of the rounding that we've done, but it should be very, very similar. So that would also work, but for most people it's much easier just to use the switching of the x and y values and then doing regression again. All right, we're going to answer a couple questions about these functions on the inverse to wrap up this section. So first of all, it says find f of 20 and explain what it means. So let's see, that means I'm using my original here and plugging in 20. So f of 20 And let's see what it comes out to. 
I get about 50, just about 56, in fact. I'm going to leave it at that. Because if you remember, back in the original, right, the input is T, the output is C. Or input T, output C. So 20 is a T value, 56 is a C value. And let's see, T of 20, that would be in the year 2020. 56% of bodies were cremated, according to our model. All right, the second, or actually the fourth question, I guess technically, part D, asks us to find F inverse of 20 and explain what that means. So now I'm going to plug 20 into my F inverse equation. Notice it's going to be a C value this time. F inverse of 20 is 0 0.6582 times 20 minus 16.9111. And again, we'll grab the calculator for that. And let's see, I get uh, about negative 3.7. All right, so this was the C value. The output of the inverse function is the T value. So let's see, that would actually be four years before, roughly four years before the year 2000. We would have been in 1996. 20% of bodies were cremated. All right, so that brings us to the end of um, this section on compositions and inverses.